Okay, this is a panel discussion about public cloud foundry platforms in Europe. Uh, and uh, it's really intended to be useful if you are um, thinking about using public cloud, foundry platform, uh, public cloud foundry or you are operating your own cloud, own cloud foundry and you uh, would like to learn from some of the people that do it at scale. So um, before we start, can you put up your hands if you're already using a public uh, cloud foundry PaaS? Okay. Take note, panelists, so you can respond appropriately to the audience. And can you put up your hand if you don't use one, but you uh, operate your own Cloud Foundry instead? Okay. Right. Uh, I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, but before that, I'm just going to make a special mention for the ones who couldn't make it. So uh, Holly Cummins from Bluemix, uh, Garish sadly couldn't be here, uh, Bridget uh, from Pivotal, and uh, Rebecca Fenoy Anthony from CenturyLink couldn't come, so look forward to having them on a future panel. Um, so my name's Dan Young. I work at a Cloud Foundry consultancy called Engineer Better, uh, and I have used a number of different public Cloud Foundry providers, so I have op opinions of my own. I will now let the panel introduce themselves. Hello, uh, I'm Jonathan Matthews. Uh, uh, despite what it might say in your... Uh, uh, apps and your schedule. I, I do not represent any large UK retailer here today. Um, I, I'm an independent Cloud Foundry uh, integrator. Um, I've used all of the people on this panel. So uh, to, I've used the products provided by all of the people on this panel today uh, and have opinions about all of them and some of the people about this on this panel have opinions on as well. But I'm sure we'll not come on to those today. Uh, so, yes, I, I am, if you like, the, the slight voice of the customer in this uh, scenario. Thank you. I'm Julian Fisher, CEO of any Nines, and uh, we started as a platform and now also do consultancy around Cloud Foundry. I'm Colin Humphreys. I'm CTO for Cloud at Pivotal. Uh, we don't have a public European PaaS at the moment, but we're giving it a lot of thought. We do have a public PaaS that operates out of the US. Uh, my name is Mark Hochstrasser. I'm running the cloud development movement Swisscom. Uh, Swisscom is a Swiss service provider, and we run a public offering of Cloud Foundry, as well as uh, a couple of enterprise offerings around that. Hi, I'm Dominic Harries. I work at the Bluemix Garage in London for IBM, and we're I'm kind of on slightly on the user side, I guess, of the public cloud, using Bluemix with customers to run projects. Okay, so if I was to look at, um, my first question is going to be sort of operations related, I think. So if I was to look at all the different uh, API versions, cloud control API versions, um, if, if you go to um, cfapi.bumix.net, somebody's written uh, an app which shows you these, they're all different. Now, that would imply that there may be some challenges in uh, deploying Cloud Foundry at scale. Um, why are they different? Who would like to take the first question? <laughs> Why is yours different? Why is yours different? You mean the platform? No, the, the versions of the APIs that are being used on your, on your platform. So if you compare that with Pivotal and with uh, Bluemix, and they're all different, they're all slightly different versions. Well, actually, the only thing that's different on our platform is the data services. So, but despite of that, it's just the regular Cloud Foundry. So, does that answer the question? I was just looking, um, what, what challenges might you have uh, when deploying Cloud Foundry that means that you can't always just run the latest version? You all appear to have different cadences of deployment and upgrade. I'm wondering if, if that, I think possibly, no. as a consumer, I'd be interested in understanding why you have the particular cadence that you have, you providers. Ah, I see. So yeah, one thing I'd like to see around the Cloud Foundry community is to organize, well, let's say a delivery cadence, uh, and a, well, it's maybe a release management that it makes it easier to do that. Because as a public, uh, or a, as an offering based on open source Cloud Foundry, you have to manage that yourself. So of course, you have to provide a CI pipeline, uh, go through testing all the, the components you want to apply to a certain version and see whether it works with all the other components you might have 
other providers don't have. For example, our billing system that takes usage data and translate it into something that we can uh, generate invoices from. So yes, that's, that's something that would be desirable. And it, of course, it is a certain burden because you have to organize that and consume resources that could actually be shared with other Cloud Foundry providers as well. Talk about uh, Pivotal Web Services. So Pivotal Web Services runs the, the kind of latest, the very latest version, the bleeding edge. So Pivotal Web Services, you'll get, I, I haven't looked at the other APIs. Last time I did check, Pivotal Web Services was ahead of all the other providers. So we're running the latest versions. We, we test it before it goes to Pivotal Web Services, but then it runs as a service in Pivotal Web Services before it goes into PCF, which is our product that you install on-prem. So you have that additional layer of kind of testing with thousands of users before it becomes part of the on-prem product. <coughs> yeah, so we, we do it almost the same. Uh, we run roughly two to four weeks behind the official release, which is yeah, roughly second or third after, after PWS goes live. And uh, we try to be very, very ad hoc and for various reasons. There are CVEs, there are security issues, so you need to be very much on the release, which is heavy for the users, you know, because sometimes API switches, our billing parts need to switch, as, as Julie mentioned. So you have challenges there, but I think we, we really focused on having a system to really upgrade very fast, because we, I think this is our duty to be on track. It's an open source product, we will find bugs, we'll find security issues. We need to be very, very much on track, and this is where we focus on. So um, Bluemix is massive. I think it's got more users than any other public cloud platform. So we have to do a bunch of scalability. So it's adding 20,000 users a week. That's yeah. what they said yeah. this morning. So it? there's a lot of scalability testing and that kind of thing. And I know there's a bunch of custom security stuff and other integration things that go in. Um, the other interesting thing about Bluemix is that we have kind of single tenant environments and local environments that we manage for our customers. And so then they get kind of a bit of choice about when they upgrade. So if you know, there's a specific event or a specific load that they need at a certain time of year, they can postpone the upgrade just to make sure everything stays. So there, there's a window that customers get to choose where they upgrade in. Okay. Um, I don't need to keep going over there because I've got my microphone here, haven't I? Um, so what feature do you not have that you wish you had as a provider in Cloud Foundry? What is it that you, that, that it might be something that is coming down the road but isn't here yet, or something that is not even conceived of yet. What would completely change your ability to operate at that sort of scale? Or would help the business? I think, um, so this is something that's coming. Um, the ability to have kind of this kind of seamless deployment to multiple availability zones. So we have um, patterns to do that, which require a bit of manual work. We have um, some services in beta. There's a CDN service in beta and that kind of thing, which help, to help developers to do that. But having kind of a single CF push and magically everything just works would be great. Obviously, it's very difficult. <laughs> I think as we talk about public cloud foundries, I think the, it's also important to see the essence. Why do we need public providers in, in Europe? Why is cloud foundry worthwhile to run publicly? And I think it's important for our customers to move workload around, to select which country they want to save the data if they need to. And this is obviously why we build it up in Switzerland. There are certain customers who want to have it there. And uh, what is missing there, and what I think we, we can really leverage ourselves as a group, and I mean, we are competitors to a certain kind, but I think the next level we should aim, and what I'm really missing is that we heavily share our services and our service marketplaces. That we heavily go forward and say, okay, uh, you can get all the whatever services in this cloud and this cloud, and we just share it together to give the customer the full experience of a public mesh of cloud foundries in Europe. I think this is the biggest miss I see. I think uh, uh, the biggest feature I think coming down the pipeline is going to be uh, the isolation segments. I know some of you in the talk earlier on. So that gives you the ability to run apps on a separate set of infrastructure. 
So I could see for public cloud providers, you could have a customer who's using Cloud Foundry quite happily and then has some apps that need to be essentially on their own set of infrastructure. So you could then allow a customer to burst out to their own infrastructure for a particular app. So it gives you the isolation of a set of runtime components, but it means that the customer doesn't have to pay for all of the control plane because the control plane can be kind of part of your core Cloud Foundry. So that gives you this benefit of being able to isolate particular workloads as required. So. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be useful for public pass providers. So I totally agree that multi-data center awareness is something that should be part of Cloud Foundry at some day, as it is a motivation for many Cloud Foundry users or adopters to go for multi-region strategies. That's true. I also agree uh, to uh, Marcus' opinion that uh, data services are important to have a certain set of common data services so that users can develop against the Cloud Foundry platform and that there's ensured that you can just take this application and run it somewhere else as well. And um, yes, so that's basically my thoughts on this. Could, could I have a go answering this question from a, a slightly Well, yeah, I was about to ask you, what's, what's the best thing and the worst thing from the user perspective about using public Cloud Foundry? In could, could, I, could I just touch on that, that question you yeah. asked? previously, sure. which is the, the, the biggest missing thing as a, a consumer of public CF in, in, in Europe is we, we have, I think, four providers here, only two of whom are actually technically, if you want to get your lawyers involved in the EU, I believe, Sw Swisscom, you're not s strictly in the EU yeah. from a... <laughs> <laughs> it's not about EU, it's about Europe. Uh, oh. Oh. <laughs> just to be very specific. Uh. So, <laughs> and, and to call, I mean... Let's talk about, don't talk about Britain. <laughs> yes, yes. That, that's another one that, that I don't know Touché. anyone else anticipated taking a, good, a couple of years off at the point that that happens. It's only, it's only Julian has left then. <laughs> so so long, long story short, that from a uh, consumer perspective, the thing I want more, uh, I, I want is, is more. More EU providers who I can point out and go, this is definitely uh, in scope for things like PCI, this is definitely in scope for personal data. Things where I don't have to cross any potentially what's the difference between EU and the Europe boundaries, things like that. Um, and, and then I've forgotten the question you actually asked me. I, I said, what, what, was the best, what is the best thing and the worst thing about depending on a public cloud manager provider for your, uh, the, instead of operating your own well, platform? The, 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 simply the best thing is, is I'm not running any servers. That, that I'm sure everyone who consumes public CF is, is aware of that as, as being a huge win. Uh, the, the worst thing, I think, uh, is uh, mitigating the difference in support and the difference in transparency that you get from different providers in the case of problems happening. Um, perhaps not intentional difference in transparency, but just uh, the effect of how their support works and the way that they communicate that with the public. That has been a significant issue for the organisations that I work with. Can I jump back to a previous point? I just uh, I realise we, we sound like we're in furious agreement at the moment on this panel. I just noticed something I wanted to pick up on, maybe a little bit contentious. So um, we were talking about services, the different services and the providers. Uh, and Julian and Marco mentioned how they think we should have a common range of services. And also, pivotal sales pitch, the pivotal services you can deploy from PCF, you can deploy them to any IaaS provider that you want. So you have this kind of a layer above your IaaS, you can put our data services down wherever you want. But I wouldn't want to sit on this panel and accuse IBM of trying to differentiate by their services and you know, lock you into IBM's PaaS by providing the services that are behind there. You know, I wouldn't want to say that, but if that was said, how would IBM respond to that? <laughs> so um, I would say, I don't know what you're talking about. If you're talking about Cloudant, <laughs> if you're talking about Cloudant, that, um, that runs on AWS and Azure. If you're talking about Compose.io, that runs on... Not today, <laughs> but um, stay, stay tuned. <laughs> I, di I did want to touch on the, on, on the motivations of the different providers for, for being in the market, because I think that's, it helps users to understand that so they can make better decisions. So um, I think Colin might have alluded there to some other motivations, allegedly, that IBM would have, which is, you know, we've got this big market where this marketplace of middleware services and, and the PaaS is kind of a, a way of reaching that. Um, but Pivotal obviously are using the very latest code in PWS. Uh, and um, John, what did we discover yesterday in the 
in the training. <laughs> Things were a little bit wobbly, maybe, sometimes? Yes, I, I, can, uh, I can absolutely see the... Um, can I keep it here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can absolutely see the, the, the benefits of doing the, of dog fooding the, the product on uh, before big enterprise customers get the, the code coming down. But it was, um, we, we certainly couldn't see any signs of uh, the, the, the slight wobbliness yesterday being recognised anywhere. Um, although, to, to be fair, that was, that was a relative outlier. Um, basically, uh, well, purely talking about PWS there. We don't generally see that as a, uh, as a problem, but we, we definitely did see... We, we didn't get information coming forward about that that I'm, I'm sure you would get if you were paying big, big enterprise bucks, but it was uh, definitely an interesting, an interesting day yesterday, given, given the context that we were sitting in. It was. I, I can... You know, I, I wasn't there in the training yesterday. I mean, and obviously, PWS, as I mentioned earlier, does run kind of the latest and greatest code. Uh, we put it through extensive testing via concourse, you know, so it's heavily tested before it goes out. But, you know, we do have, like, bugs will emerge. I can say, uh, you know, I was, I've only been at Pivotal for seven months. Prior to that, I was, you know, I used PWS extensively as a customer. And in my experience, it was the most stable uh, uh, public cloud foundry, you know, uh, and we're looking potentially at bringing it to Europe, running PWS in Europe. But as I said earlier, PWS does run the latest and greatest. That means if you're paying for PCF, you get something that's far more heavily tested, you know, has gone through far more in terms of, uh, you know, has all the security fixes, everything else we can possibly get into there to make it as good as possible. So obviously, as Pivotal, we're, we're like, PCF is our focus. PWS is something we use to make PCF better. So yeah, the, I guess the, the message there is that it's not, uh, it's not meant to be a profit-making venture. It's, it's kind of a... It, it, it's, a, it's a very useful service, but it also helps Pivotal actually develop their it, it commercial gives you a, products. A great try before you buy, you know, and it's fantastic for really we, we all the code we ship we run as a service before you run it as a service. But our focus is PCF. So one of the customers that I've been working with um, had an incredible statistic where they said um, they it was their Christmas food ordering website, and they had. Uh, move from a situation where they were spending $98,000 on hardware just for that, you know, that short three-month period of the year, uh, and then they'd moved to a public cloud foundry provider in Europe, and they're now spending $200. So um, my question would be, um, how is anyone making any money out of that? What, what kind of scale do you need to be running at to, to, for that to be a, a viable business? So I've been through the valley of darkness with uh, public offering uh, at any night. So uh, we started at, at a hosted vSphere cluster and moved to a self-hosted OpenStack, which was the most horrific thing I've ever done. Uh, and uh, calculating prices against Heroku, the largest competitor, two challenges are when offering uh, a Cloud Foundry platform with no domain-specific differentiator, such as being an IoT platform or something, which is, first, when Heroku came up, it was seven years ago, I think then there was a wave of there's this something new. Everybody looked at it, just like the hype around Docker is today. And you will not get this second wave. So you have to find yourself a marketing that has more uh, you know, other, other points of attraction. And the second is infrastructure. So infrastructure in general is a very hard topic and uh, our value proposition used to be 100% uh, European. Currently our target sits on AWS because we were unable to find a trustworthy infrastructure provider being entirely operated in, in Europe, not being held by a US holding company that offers us infrastructure as a service so we can build a platform on top of it. The calculation from a cost perspective uh, with a self-hosted OpenStack allowed us, allowed us to be competitive with Heroku from day one, even at a very small scale. So from, from an economical point of view, I'd say it is possible that, that, let's say, smaller data centers use infrastructure as a service and put a cloud foundry on top of it and make a viable business out of it. In case they are entirely focused on that, we've been distracted distracted by consulting business also. And if, if they manage to get the infrastructure stable. So um, maybe truly on your first point, 
we are happy to help you with the infrastructure, you know. <laughs> we are a non-EU country, but in Europe. So like every UK provider. Uh, so maybe let me know. Huh? We can find a price tag. No, um, we also run an open stack, which obviously helps us bring the cost down. It was not easy. Um, a lot of people here in the room probably think of these days right now. Um, it was hard, but I think it, it's worthwhile. Uh, the public offering was for us, especially in the beginning, it was clearly intended to be a business card to show that we are a cloud provider, that we have pass in the market, and also to push the Cloud Foundry message. Our main market was at the enterprise offerings, where we have dedicated Cloud Foundries, uh, fully, fully uh, virtual private, where we encapsulate network and all that stuff. This was our target. Uh, what we saw in the last six months is that the public our public um, environment really grew, and uh, we are on a stage where we said we, it's way bigger than we ever thought it will be, and also the, the revenue <laughs> economics really work, work. and uh, we also see quite a lot of non-Swiss customers, you know, for whatever reason put their data in non-EU countries, but it's fine, <laughs> we're happy to get it. Cool, I'd say um, the kind of cost per hour is one cost that you'll have on public. Um, a lot of IBM's customers obviously enter into more comprehensive agreements around what they're providing, around support, around services, all that kind of thing, um, which I think allows that basic cost per hour to be very competitive, but also partly as a calling card to maybe a single tenant environment or that kind of thing, but also as just something which opens you up to services that may be chargeable or support that may be chargeable as well. So of those um, 20,000 new users a week, what, what proportion of those are startups? Because obviously Bluemix is quite focused on startups. That's a good Bluemix. question. And I don't what have percentage the numbers, is, is enterprise? Um, okay. And if I had the numbers, I don't even know. I'd be allowed to tell <laughs> okay. you. But um, we, we work in the biggest, I think the biggest startup co-location environment in the world and we work in Moorgate, that's where our office sits. And we've had some really great successes with startups coming along using the platform. It's very easy to get started with the built-in DevOps and the things like the Watson services, which allow you to spend pennies for stuff that you would have had to have you know, a massive contract with a big supplier for before. I guess the same question to the others. Are you, the other providers here, are you seeing um, more larger enterprises starting to say, we don't need to run our own cloud foundries? Because so um, we see both, right. uh, but we see more enterprise and we see, we see actually more enterprise developers, which are kind of stick with the internal IT um, situation and then move into our cloud. So for instance, uh, two months after we launched our public cloud, one CEO of a bank in Switzerland called, called me or to, to, to ask me if we can shut down the organization, which some of his team did. You know, that we should stop his team pushing apps to our cloud because they're not allowed to. <laughs> and this was a very nice conversation. <laughs> I should have recorded it, but I think we have, we have quite a lot of organizations which, which are really big organizations where some developers really try to, to have an easier way still deploy in Switzerland, but have a very easy way to use cloud, and that's where they come. So we see, but it's, it's I would say, half-half, rough. -half, okay. Yeah, I think uh, we find it quite interesting how a lot of our, you know, our big enterprise customers, they have you know, VMware or uh, OpenStack on-prem, they buy PCF to deploy onto it, they deploy onto it, and then, in, interestingly, quite often, you know, they'll either hit capacity limits with what they can have on-prem, or, or, or some of the reason they can't you know, scale anymore, and then they'll just put Cloud Foundry on Amazon. They'll just scale out. And that's where we see like, huge amounts of value, where all of a sudden you know, they, were, they, they, they were used to hitting some kind of a capacity limit, and now they can just be like, oh, we'll put PCF on AWS, we'll scale that out. The apps run exactly the same, the data services run exactly the same. So we've, kind of, we've, we've removed that friction between the, you know, being able to take workloads from one infrastructure and put it down on another one. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of people going from uh, you know, on-prem to running their own Cloud Foundry on AWS to then starting to use a public cloud provider as well. I, has, I haven't seen a huge amount of that, um, but maybe that's because you know, that's not really been our focus. It's, I think it's more gone the other way. People will try out Cloud Foundry um, on PWS, you know, enjoy it, and then 
like to install PCF either on prem or on AWS? So I'd say that uh, the, the the size a cloud foundry makes makes sense to be on premise. Uh, you know, how big should a company be so that it makes sense to use your own cloud foundry? I'd say that it's it's surprisingly small. So you can make use of a cloud foundry in a certain circumstances being dedicated. However, the cloud is about sharing. So when you look at, at Amazon, at a certain time, they just open up their infrastructure to be used by others. So what's the big value in using Amazon? Amazon has a, a let's say, unlimited capacity. From our perspective as a small organization, I'm running a 50-people company here, like the, the way the smallest company represented on the board, I guess. So for us, Amazon is unbelievably big. Where our infrastructure had around, let's say, two terabyte of RAM, so when a customer onboards a small platform, the question is, how much of elasticity do you actually need? And the same thing is when you run dedicated cloud foundries within your data centers, how big is your infrastructure? How much of that infrastructure is taken by your cloud foundry? And how much elasticity do you need within the runtime and within the infrastructure part of your infrastructure? So uh, with that, the question, it could be that you have to order new hardware because you hit a boundary because there was user growth uh, and it hit you unexpectedly. So in that case, on Amazon, you'd possibly be able to just use more resources because they just have more free space. And that's a calculation everybody has to do. Are you big enough to make use and uh, to benefit from the platform within that boundaries of your data center or your co-location? Is there any audience questions? Because before we reach the end, I should really check who, who's got burning questions for the panel, because we've got the microphone. Anyone at all? Can I Alex, can you have one? You did? Think <laughs> safe harbor? Yeah. Good. So I think uh, the question was, does Pivotal plan to offer the uh, services from PCF on PWS? Is that correct? Uh, yes, we do. We're looking at that. They're kind of, we're making them incrementally more and more available to customers. So we're very much doing that. Um, but that's taken a while, I admit. But we, we are, yeah, that's definitely happening now. Does the same thing go for tiles that you can download from the Pivotal network? So for services written by other companies, or would you be able to use those on PWS as well? I think the question was, does the, are we also going to run the tiles from other companies on uh, PWS? Um, I think that's maybe happening, but I don't want to make a commitment right now. We're agile. So I wouldn't dream of making a commitment. <laughs> it's certainly something when we'll learn from running our other PCF tiles on PWS, and then if that's successful, we'll then look maybe with our partners to bring uh, you know, their offerings as well. Quick question here. What would you call your success that you would like to have within a year in order to provide the best thing to your customers? That's a great question, and it does play towards the title of the talk, which is what can we, what can we do next? How can we really improve this marketplace? Maybe just touching on what Marco said. So it's you know that positive sum game aspect of working together as a community to to improve things. Um, I think that more visibility about how one can transparently or, or easily migrate across different public providers would be, from a consumer's perspective, really useful. Um, there are there are currently a, a couple of ch some challenges that we that we face, um, so I think that would probably be a a good thing for the whole community of public provider public consumers to be able to say we can take a bit of service here and a bit of service there and not have to hugely care about the distinction between them outside of the services layer. I totally agree. So, taking the perspective of the cloud foundry end user, I want to set up a, a cloud foundry CLI on my computer. 
I want to set the target, deploy an app, and I want to do the same thing by just changing the target. That's my desire. And I don't want to care about the versions or, or whatever. When, when I have a manifest file specifying the dependency tree of my app, I want to do CF push and not worry about anything else. That's the main motivation why I use a public pass. And currently there's so much heterogeneity that, that they, there's so many differences between the platforms that this is impossible right away. And I think if that is improved, that's, that would be a benefit for the end user. Um, I'm probably going to answer this subtly differently. So what I would love to see happen within a year would be uh, some large European companies uh, take part in Cloud Foundry dojos, have more uh, core committers to Cloud Foundry from Europe, um, and bring in you know, platinum members, gold members to the foundation of Cloud Foundry from European companies. I know we've got a few. I'd love to see more of them. I'd love to see far more you know, other companies getting involved, far more core committers. Like Cloud Foundry is ours. So let's invest more in it you know, as, as people. Let's put more people onto it. Let's uh, uh, just you know, help it grow. I think it um, also goes in the direction of growth, but I think we just need more providers as well. You know? I know a couple of providers which will probably, one will probably launch already this year, and maybe one other I know next year, early next year. So this is cool, but I think we need more. We so need it's a good business to be in. If there's anyone who wants to start a Cloud Foundry yes, body, yeah, you recommend it. I think, I think we, should, we, should, <laughs> we should make it very easy for service providers in Europe, which are dedicated in their countries, to launch something like Cloud Foundry. And this also goes in the direction, like, how small does it Cloud Foundry need to be to run it by yourself? Yeah, it can be very small, but it's f very hard <laughs> to run it, you know. It's very hard to run it. Yeah, you need, you need very, very good engineers. You need people who know how the upstream works. You need very, very fast cycles and security updates. You need, you need to have your hands on that stuff. And uh, I think this, this is very important. So size is not the only thing. PCF helps with all of that, in case you were wondering. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. We're finished. <laughs> Unless yeah. there's any more questions, I think we're probably keeping everyone from their coffee. So, uh, um, Dom, did you have something else you wanted to add? I, know, I, I would just say, I, I, along a similar line, I think um, the seamless transition so that if you have <coughs> some stuff already in AWS or some stuff you want in public cloud, some stuff you want in a single tenant cloud or on-premise, just a good story for how you can easily connect those things and work with what people already have. Okay, great. Thank you very much to our panelists and for everyone for coming. <laughs>